welcome to Street Epistemology, Slaying Dragons and Spotting Cons. I want to start this off by thanking Derek Colanduno, um, Rachel Reeves, and all of DragonCon for being so uh, incredibly welcoming to us here. I do want to apologize to the DragonCon dragon for having evil thoughts about bringing him into Photoshop and doing some nasty things, but my, my humanist instincts overcame that, so he remained intact. What we're going to do is we're going to just each introduce ourselves um, briefly, and then Tim has a couple questions for the audience, and then we're going to dive in. So my name is Rob Penzak. I'm a physician turned writer. I'm the executive director of Atheist Alliance, and we're making a big push to kind of teach street epistemology to a very broad group is our goal over the next uh, year or two. Um, and we're going to bring a couple real experts in next year. I'm president of Richmond Humanists. I also do a show called Road to Reason, Skeptic's Guide to the 21st Century out of Fairfax. Um, and I think that's enough for me. And so if we can each just go down the line. Check. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. My name is Phil Torres, and uh, I'm uh, an author and a writer, uh, also a regular contributor at the Future of Life Institute, uh, which is based in Boston and uh, uh, deals with sort of you know big picture global issues that are are facing humanity. Uh, I'm also the the founding director of the X Risk Institute, and perhaps uh, later on we'll we'll discuss a bit more what the uh, aims of this institute are. Hi, my name is David Tamayo. I'm president and founder of Hispanic American Freethinkers, and uh, I'm also the host of a podcast called Contrapuntos, where I make the life miserable to preachers that dare come to my show in Spanish. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm hoping to, uh, with this talk here today, to learn as much as I can uh, give out also. So I'm just hoping that, uh, that uh, Trump doesn't get me out of here before uh, at the end of the show. <laughs> Hey, I had to throw that out. I'm John Loftus. I'm a writer of books. I've uh, had uh, about 10 published in the last eight years, and I think I'm done, finally, with that. We'll see. I want to be uh, more of an activist uh, from here on, and uh, I am going to enjoy this new role. We'll see if it lasts, because I've always said I, I'm done after the last book, and I yet put out another one, so we'll have to see how that works. <laughs> I'm Tim Dawson. I'm a aerospace engineering PhD student at Georgia Tech, and in the spare time that I don't have, I'm also president of Campus Free Thinkers, the only SSA-affiliated group at Georgia Tech. Uh, I've also been involved with the street epistemology community for the better part of three years. So I wanted to ask a few questions to get a feel for the audience. Who here identifies as a skeptic? Yeah, that, that, that's about what I expected. Uh, who here has heard of A Manual for Creating Atheists by Dr. Peter Boghossian? A good number of you. Have any of you actually gone out and practiced street epistemology? Okay, we got like three mostly up here. Okay. Okay. Um, we also wanted to find out, uh, you don't have to volunteer, or volunteer yourself if you don't want. Are there any theists in the audience or any people that have you know, some supernatural beliefs? Um, Cause cause we're looking for someone to practice on. Would you stand up, identify yourself, <laughs> give us your social security number, please? <laughs> Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, no, what we really, one of our goals is to get past just the skeptic bubble and speak to a mainstream audience. So we hope you enjoy this. We'd love your feedback afterward. And we really are you know, trying to make this a broad thing. All right, so we're going to get started here. All right, so uh, one thing that's helpful if you're learning about street epistemology is to go back to the beginning and learn about cave epistemology. Um, how many people are familiar with this picture um, from you know, reference to Plato's Republic? So probably uh, maybe a third, half the people. So the idea here, and I'm sorry, it's hard to see the audience, so I'm going to try to stop doing that. You can smack me if I keep doing that. Um, the idea here is that Plato thought the vast majority of people live their life in ignorance, you know, completely unaware of reality, as if they're prisoners chained at the back of the cave, staring at the wall and watching shadows dance, and never understanding that there's a separate reality. So they wouldn't ever appreciate the uh, friendly Skepticon dragon coming in. They just see his distorted shadow on the wall, think it's a devil, and come up with their own explanations for it. He thought that philosophers had an ethical duty to try to help educate people um, and get them out of this and help them see the light, even though he wouldn't, they wouldn't be well received. Once your eyes are uh, accustomed to the dark, if you have a bright light, it's not going to be a, a friendly um, greeting for you. And if you have somebody that comes back in, if a philosopher, once he's used to seeing in the light, comes back in, he's not going to make any sense to you. The voice is going to be echoed. So this is um, 
this becomes a, a metaphor for what you're going to do with street epistemology, is that 2000, you know, 2,000 years later, Peter Boghossian came along and said, we need to take this out of the cave and onto the street and help modern day people stop living with delusions, stop living you know, with illusions and thinking the reality and help to teach them you know, a better epistemic system, a better way of understanding the world so that they too can discover the truth, even if it's not always comfortable. So that's a little bit about street epistemology. Um, we're going to jump to the motivation. You know, why should we do this? Why bother to do street epistemology? Why bother to do any secular activism at all? What's the harm in just leaving everybody in their own caves, you know, thinking whatever they want to think? And I'd like to have Phil kind of explain some of the risks from a, an existential view. Yeah, so I think street epistemology is um, of critical importance because it really matters what people believe. What people believe affects who they vote for, it affects the decisions that they make, um, you know, just mundane quotidian decisions they make every single day. Um, and so, you know, my, my own work, which I alluded to a moment ago, with the x Race Institute and the Future of Life Institute, uh, focuses mostly on the biggest sort of risk. It's, it's, a, it's actually a, a topic that's quite good for DragonCon because it's, it's pretty epic uh, issues. Um, so th these are called like existential risks. Uh, these are, these are you know, catastrophic scenarios that would either result in human extinction or would catapult us back into uh, the Stone Age or, or some uh, state of permanent privation like that. Um, and you know, so today, the reason this is a field of study, for the longest time it was only religious individuals who were uh, curious about the end of the world. And that was, that was part of a, a branch of theology called eschatology. And uh, some of you may have heard of the rapture. That's, that's a big part of, uh, of uh, a certain kind of evangelical uh, eschatology. Um, so for the longest time, you know, people have been sort of fascinated by the end of the world uh, since Zoroaster, probably, which was uh, quite a bit before Jesus was born. Uh, but today, the, the situation is such that, on the one hand, we have the tools necessary to actually study ways that humanity could, uh, you know, could encounter some sort of uh, global uh, catastrophic risk. Um, and on the other hand, the number of risks is, uh, is, is growing uh, as, you know, technology advances further and further. So, um, you know, so there are a lot of risks that, that stem from technology. And in addition, there are other anthropogenic risks like climate change and biodiversity loss, uh, the latter of which is not super well known. Um, but just to, just to give you an idea of how genuinely how uh, serious it is, uh, the, the 2014 Living Planet Report found that between 1970 and 2010, the global population of vertebrates, which includes like mammals, birds, uh, fish, amphibians, and so on, uh, declined by an incredible 52%. So it's, and you're, you know, you're sort of welcome to extrapolate that number to the future. Uh, you don't quite get to, uh, you know, 2050. So, yeah, so the situation is, is quite uh, dire. So the reason I, I bring this up is, is there is a, a sort of weight to the, the, the situation that's, that's historically unprecedented. It really matters that people uh, take science seriously. They listen to experts. They think, ultimately, they think critically uh, because unlike in the past where uh, a failure to engage in good epistemological uh, habits might result in limited human suffering, we're, so, we're sort of entering this new epoch in which uh, the, the degree of human suffering could be global, in, global and transgenerational in scope. So, um, yeah, I, I'm going to try to move this along with. So I remember one of the numbers that you threw out that was very striking is you said that the experts peg the risk of going extinct in the next 100 years somewhere maybe between 20 and 40 or 50 percent. It's not one in a million. It's not one in a thousand. It's really substantial. So it becomes all the more important that we start thinking uh, Yeah, well. the by comparison, the probability uh, that, that has been given by many of the experts, uh, these are respectable scientists and philosophers, uh, is, is quite a bit larger than the probability of dying in a plane crash or a car crash. Uh, you know, all sorts of, so, you know, sort of everyday risks that people worry about. Okay. All right. So I'm going to jump past a couple of these here. So, you know, so we've just touched on a lot of this. Um, credulity costs a lot of money. We spend more on vitamins and alternative or fake medicine, you know, non-scientifically based medicine than we spend on our National Institutes of Health. 
Um, I, I pulled these numbers quickly off the internet and they met my cognitive desire. I'm not sure about the vitamins number. That's one that I saw. I've seen lower numbers. At any rate, we spend astronomical amounts of, on, on nonsense um, and it means we're not studying other things. As Phil mentioned, beliefs influence behavior. So whether we're speaking historically, biblically, outside of this country or inside of this country, what people believe, often based on a faulty um, system of understanding the world, has really bad, important consequences. And so it becomes incumbent upon all of us to take a more activist role and try to do something about this. We can't just leave everybody in their cave thinking what they want. Um, you know, it has a lot of bad effects. Another point is that reality is shared. Whether somebody believes things or not, they're happening. Um, and rhetorical flourishes work. So I don't know if James Imhoff truly doesn't believe in global climate, you know, global warming, but that snowball is a good visual effect that works. If you speak in a cadence, you speak loud, you speak confidently, that all influences a lot of people that aren't critical thinkers. Um, so it's, it's really important that all of us develop you know, better systems of thinking about the world. And the last thing is overconfidence. Um, Charles Darwin has a good quote, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. And we see this all the time. Scientists are always seeking information, disconfirming evidence. Uh, Ken Ham here is shown saying there's absolutely nothing that would change his mind, and that's a problem. All right. Yeah, so with that background in mind, let's talk about what street epistemology actually is. So I pulled up a, the definition from streetepistemology.com, which I highly recommend you guys check out. But in a nutshell, it's a way to talk to people that helps get them to think more critically. Uh, so I know people aren't big fans of uh, six-syllable words like epistemology. So I, as an engineer, I understand the, the importance of defining the jargon that I'm going to use. Next slide. So uh, actually, perhaps Phil would be more qualified. Do you want to define epistemology for us? Yeah, so epistemology is just the study of, uh, sometimes it's translated as theory of knowledge, but it's basically just the study of the justification, what it means to have a, a belief that's justified or reasonable or warranted, uh, the nature of truth, uh, and, and also, you know, w what exactly a belief is in the first place. Yeah. So. Pre pretty foundational stuff. I mean, it, all of your mental life, uh, every, every intellectual uh, domain is ultimately founded on some kind of epistemological theory. Yeah, so as it says on the slide, it's how we separate fact from fiction. And there are various ways of doing this. Uh, some are more reliable than others. For example, I could try just flipping a coin if it's heads the belief is true. If it's tails, the belief is false. That gives me a 50% success rate. Maybe we can do a little bit better than that, and hopefully we can help everyone to realize the importance of doing better than a 50-50 shot. Uh, so street epistemology now is, uh, so I want to lay out the goals of street epistemology. Uh, first off, we want to help people to think about why they believe what they believe. We want to help equip them to better separate fact from fiction. And then in the process, we want to avoid common pitfalls. Uh, and I'll get into those on the next set of slides. Uh, but conversational pitfalls. So the street in street epistemology refers to conversations. And these are primarily dialogues, so not me talking to you as a room, but perhaps you alone in an elevator with someone, you just strike up a conversation. These are the conversations that we have every day, nothing special about them. They're not formal debates or structured formats. I've heard this go a lot better with a bottle of wine. Yeah. Yes, actually, that, we won't get into that. Uh, and as we already explained, epistemology then in street epistemology is using these conversations to improve people's epistemology. So I'm going to breeze through these real quick, but here are some conversational pitfalls that might sound really familiar to you. Uh, and this, this motivates why we need a technique for just having a normal conversation as we're calling it. So arguing semantics. I don't know if many of you spend time on Reddit or YouTube participating in discussions, but very often you can find yourself just arguing over terminology and not actually getting to the core of what you're discussing. Uh, the backfire effect is a 
well-studied psychological phenomenon, which is essentially when you present facts to a person that run counter to their beliefs, usually instead of updating their worldview accordingly, they put up mental barriers and block themselves off from any further change. So for example, uh, actually, I'm going to give a joke instead of an example. I'm not much of a comedian, so I'm just going to read it off my slides. I apologize. <laughs> so two JFK conspiracy theorists die and go to heaven. They finally ask God to once and for all settle who killed JFK. God sighs and patiently and lovingly admonishes them. You've spent so much time, so much of your lives chasing after this conspiracy. You've sacrificed time with your families, allowed yourselves to be overcome by paranoia. Oswald killed Kennedy. He was acting on his own, and all of the evidence you needed to satisfy yourselves of that was there the whole time. One conspiracy theorist turns to the other and whispers, this goes higher than we thought. <laughs> Finally, uh, red herrings, they're a, a favorite of mine. Sometimes when you ask someone to give a reason for their belief, instead of giving the core, most important reason, they give you what sounds to them as the strongest, most unassailable reason. We, as three epistemologists, need to be able to recognize that these, that tackling that reason that they gave countering it, trying to disprove it, isn't going to actually change anything. Because if you were to instead ask them, so let's say this reason you gave me turned out to be false, would that change your mind? They're going to say no. I just thought it sounded, well, they're going to think it sounds really strong, therefore it must be a good reason. Uh, next slide. So when you're tackling a big deeply held belief, such as the belief that God exists, you're going to get examples like, well, there's fulfilled prophecies in, in my holy book. I prayed and it was answered. Uh, I heard once that there was a miracle and that supports my belief. None of these reasons really sound like reasons to someone who's skeptically minded. So you could spend time trying to knock down these pillars one by one in the hopes that you can topple the whole thing, but maybe it would be easier to, f to just examine the foundation, their epistemology, why they think that those reasons are valid in the first place. Uh, so, John, would you like to define faith in this context for us? <clears throat> it's irrational. <laughs> it's, a, it's a way to leapfrog over the probabilities or to dig tunnels under it. Um, usually leapfrog over, it's uh, assigning a higher degree of probability to an event or a claim than is warranted and usually that's due to confirmation bias. I had already said that earlier. They need a good dose of David Hume um, who was uh, probably the greatest English speaking philosopher when he, I'm going to translate for you, um, we need to proportion our level of assent on the probability of the evidence, and that's, that's, that's it. Just per, if something is 60% um, you know, probable, or 75% probable, or 80 or 90, or whatever the probabilities are, then that's all you can assign the, you know, to an event or to a claim. You, faith adds nothing to it, see? So if you're evidence-based, Faith is irrelevant. It's, uh, it's, not even, it's not even something you want to put into the equation. Faith does nothing. Probabilities based on the evidence do everything. So I'd like to mention something here that perhaps the word faith is, is a little bit overgeneralized. I, I, under this word that we're using for faith, I would include a bunch of other stuff like uh, uh, culture and uh, maybe patriotism and, and, uh, and that kind of stuff that uh, typically sometimes people unconsciously don't see that that's what's holding them back on things. And they, I mean, how many of you have been told as little kids, don't go out without a, without a jacket because it's raining and you, you're gonna catch a cold. Uh, my mom used to tell me if you go barefooted and it's too cold, your, your feet are gonna get crooked. 
uh, stuff like that. And we, you, you know, we never think of questioning those things, but under faith, I, I like to think about traditions, cultures, uh, a lot of things. A lot of skeptics fairly often do not question culture or feel uncomfortable uh, questioning culture because they figured, well, you know, it's, that's the way of life. We, we, should, we should just let people be in different ways. And that's fine if you're trying to choose between falafel bread and white bread. But if you're trying to, uh, when it affects negatively, when it affects people in a, in a bad way, then we need to question uh, everything, uh, whether it's uh, religion, whether it's tradition, uh, anything that we, that we assume uh, as this common knowledge that has gone for centuries, perhaps, without ever being tested. So. I, th I think it's also worth mentioning very briefly that there, because um, I, I feel like a lot of discussions about the nature of faith are confounded by the fact that there are two senses of the term that are pretty regularly used. In one sense, it's, um, it's more or less synonymous with trust, right? So you could, you could replace the word faith with trust. I have faith in my friends. I have faith in you know, the, the bridge that I'm driving over that it's not going to collapse. Uh, and then there's another sense, which is a sense which is really belief-based, and that's the sense that's relative to epistemology. It's the sense that's relative to religion. It's 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 I have faith that you know God exists, or that uh, you know there was some deity that rose from the dead, or was born a virgin, or something like that. Yeah. So I think the distinction during street epistemology uh, is when you ask someone why do you believe that that's true, and they answer because I have faith, if they're using faith as a synonym for trust, well, you would, you would obviously follow that up with, why do you have trust? And then they would say, based on you know, evidence or anecdotes or something. You can't really get any further than faith, though, as the, the relevant definition here. Why do you have faith? It stands on its own. It doesn't have to have any further reasons. That is the type of faith, faith as an epistemology, that we want to tackle here. And uh, one thing, for instance, uh, going to the columns in, in the graph, uh, I've seen a lot of people in the Hispanic community here in the US that um, go from uh, one holy book to another holy book. I mean, there are 200, over 200,000 Hispanics in the US that in the last 10 years have converted to Islam. And so instead of going to a religion that might be lighter and you know less uh, misogynistic than than the, what they were they seem to go to one that seems to to have more issues in that respect so knocking those those columns sometimes they just get replaced by a different column and you kind of have to start all over again it's like putting a band-aid on a bleeding wound yeah. all right so i'd like to talk a little bit about the actual applications of street epistemology uh, so I talked a little bit about applying it to religious claims, but I would venture to say that it can be applied to any knowledge claim because it deals with how we form knowledge. Uh, as a quick example, you know, there's lots of people have superstitious thinking about one thing or another. Here's an example of an actual elevator, and this is more common than you would think. Do you notice anything missing? Yep. Uh, so, you know, you could, you could strike up a conversation with someone by pointing out, hey, this elevator doesn't have a, a 13, like there's no 13th floor. And imagine they respond, well, that's great because, you know, 13 is an unlucky number. You c there's a few ways you could go from there. My, what I would do nine times out of ten is just go, oh, okay and then get off at my floor and never, probably never encounter that person again. Uh, or you could just strike up an argument right off the bat and say, well, numbers can't be unlucky, that's absurd. Uh, the street epistemology approach would be something more like, oh, so you believe that numbers can be unlucky? Yeah. Why do you believe that? And we'll get more into the technique itself, but it's all about getting them to think about the foundations of their belief. Uh, Can I jump in for a second before you ask another part? He's also not just speaking intellectually. We're actually asking all of you guys out there. Street epistemology really is a call to activism and action. And this is something that everybody here can do in a very friendly, simple way that, that Tim just laid out. Next time somebody says something that doesn't pass muster, 
it's not polite just to live, you know, Sam Harris has a book about lying. This is, you know, you can, I don't know if you classify it the same way, but it's not helpful to people to just quietly let them go about in a delusion. And there's some very simple non-confrontational techniques that we can all use. And so I hope you guys, the purpose of today is to get you guys interested in this, to want to learn more about it and show you some resources. Um, we'll show you some people that are really hardcore and make this their life, but all of us can use this conversational technique every day without going too far outside of our own comfort zone. Yeah. Uh, I did want to ask David, did you have any examples of superstitious thinking? Oh, I, I could spend all night with examples. We have, you know, spilling salt, uh, broken mirrors, ladders, black cat, you know, black, black cats, things like that. Uh, and then we have some that are sort of across uh, uh, different, you know, palm reading, horoscopes, things of the sort, across cultures. Uh, and some that are specific to, to certain cultures or certain uh, ethnic groups. Uh, my mom as a little kid, when uh, we had a visitor that had overstayed their visit for too long, she'd take a, a broom and put it behind the door, and supposedly that would make him go away, but I wasn't sure if it was because they saw that and knew that that was the signal to get up. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, uh, we've heard uh, James Randi take uh, horoscopes and give it to students and then sort of show them that they all, they all say, yeah, this is unique to me, it's perfect, and then everyone has the same horoscope uh, and find out that you know, so definitely, uh, I think the main thing with this is that it's, it's not just for others. I, I think it's a little bit sometimes condescending to think, hey, we got it. Everybody else doesn't have so, it. Point, so, that's actually the next slide. Oh, okay, there you go. So, great segue. segue. <laughs> yeah. Uh, street epistemology, I think, can be used for self-improvement as well. Uh, on one level, simply being aware of why other people... Uh, like try to put up their defenses and defend their beliefs against reason, it can help you to be aware of when you are doing the same thing when presented with evidence that runs counter to your beliefs. And in general, it makes us more mindful of our own epistemology and why we choose an evidence-based or not evidence-based epistemology in different situations. There's a second level as well, and I know like I said, it seems strange that you would need techniques to have a conversation. Well, some people are not so great at conversations where it doesn't come naturally to us. It's uh, street epistemology borrows heavily from things like motivational interviewing, where you just learn general ways to have a conversation that's productive and friendly. Uh, things like active listening, where you repeat back to someone what they said using your own words, uh, being mindful of body language, modeling the behavior you wish to see. Uh, if you want someone to learn from you, you really should be open to learning from them. And I think Rob wanted to take yeah, part. So, so this is just, you know, I feel very much the same way as Tim, that this is something that isn't just about faith and we can extend it to all sorts of facets of our life. Um, Politics is something where we can very quickly get off the track and we get very dogmatic or very ideological. My side is right, your side is stupid. That doesn't lead to any productive conversation. Um, so the more we're able to actually actively listen, it doesn't mean that we'll suddenly agree with the other side, but don't assume the worst in them. Try to extend them the most charitable you know, view of what they're saying and listen openly. And then if you disagree for a reason, state that openly. Um, and just using these techniques, lets you have honest conversations about really important subjects that we need to discuss. So as, you know, as a society, if we're not discussing these, we're, we're just heading in a bad direction, and as Phil's pointed out, it's going to catch up with us soon. Um, so we're going to talk about becoming a street epistemologist. Um, Peter Bogosian in his book mentions that, is everybody familiar with the Four Horsemen, I assume? Um, you know, so these are four people that really brought atheism into the light in a very uh, dynamic way. Publishing books on that field became uh, a lot more acceptable. Talking about it became more acceptable. But these are four people, and there's seven billion people in the world. And if we really want to affect change, we need to reach sort of a critical mass of people that are out there trying to get people to think more clearly. So in, in Peter's book, he talks about getting 10,000 street epistemologists who are out there just having these conversations. And again, it doesn't have to be that you go to a college, get students, videotape them having a conversation about their faith, which some people do. It can just be that when somebody says something that doesn't hang together, instead of smiling and nodding, you actually you bring it up and you do it in, in, in a positive way. Um, 
So the, it's just sort of a rundown of what street epistemology would be, is if you're going to talk about something contentious, first take a few seconds to establish rapport. So you know, it could be, hey, I, I like baseball too. What's your favorite team? That silly little nicety, whatever it happens to be, I'm a vegetarian too. It doesn't matter what it is. Getting that human contact will shape the tone of the whole conversation that you're going to have. And it's worth taking, and I'm terrible at this, a lot of critical thinkers probably just want to get to the logic part. <laughs> but that's not how most people operate. Um, so you, you know, take those few seconds. Your goal during that conversation should be to have a friendly, collegial, collaborative conversation. You're not trying to catch these people in error. You're not trying to make them look stupid or feel silly. You're trying to get both of you to explore why you believe whatever that topic is. Um, and you really should, as, as David said, you actually genuinely have to be open. And Tim, too, model the behavior. Be open. If they bring up a point that you hadn't thought of, don't dive back into your debate points and make sure you don't lose. Acknowledge it. Say, you know, I haven't thought of it that way. If you don't know how to answer something they bring up, don't be embarrassed. Say, that's a good point. I don't know. Let me think about it. Let's talk again next week. This is kind of the behavior that all of us can adopt. Um, Peter calls that authenticity. Uh, be authentic, and uh, just exactly what you were saying. If you don't know the answer, just say you don't know. I mean, uh, I, I don't know a lot, and um, you know it, it shows. Uh, but when I'm in a conversation with people, I'll, I'll tell them I don't know. I'll find out, you know. And um, it, it's uh, being authentic. It's it's something believers don't usually do. <laughs> they they're thinking about an answer to everything all along the way. So don't do the same. Don't be like them. You don't know. Say you don't know. Be authentic. I think this also gets at the issue that it's, it's, not, it's not about um, convincing somebody that you're right and, and they're wrong or that, you know, the, the atheists, uh, you know, that's th this is uh, the, the sure, you know, d definitely the right belief in, in Christianity or Islam or whatever isn't. Um, it's, I, I think the idea is that the world would, be, would benefit most if, if individuals were more in the cognitive habit of reflecting on their beliefs, and that applies to not only religious people but but atheists as well. I mean, they're, they're you know, you can come to the the belief of atheism uh, in an irrational manner. Uh, so it's it's you know, I, I think the most the, the most beneficial aspect of street epistemology is getting everybody to think, and part of that is most definitely acknowledging. You know, the the fact is these days everybody knows almost nothing about most things. Uh, you know, there's, there's just so much to know. Of course, if you, if you have Google, you know everything, right? Yeah, so there is a sense in which we have an extended mind, you know, and... and uh, but, 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 I mean, yeah. you're right. I think I, a win is any step in the right direction is a win. And, yeah. and this is not a, a natural process. It's not easy. It takes practice. And, and so the more you do it, the better you get at it for yourself and for, and for other people around you. And uh, so, you know, a win, yeah, a win is in any movement in the right direction. Even So if someone that is very hardcore, very dogmatic about anything, uh, they become less dogmatic, that's a win for everybody. And I don't know if Peter, off the top of my head, if Peter talks, if Peter Bogosian talks about this in his, in his book, uh, which I read a while ago, but I mean, I, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't uh, practice with yourself. You know, I, I have certain political beliefs and, and religious beliefs and so on. Um, why exactly do I have those beliefs? And, you know, can I, can I uh, satisfy myself, you know, in an explicit manner that the, the various beliefs that I adhere to are actually reasonable? A lot of uh, street epistemology is straight out of Socrates in the dialogues, and Peter brilliantly translates it to the rest of us. Uh, Socrates was told he's the wisest uh, man alive, and so he went around testing this. So he asked the sophists, okay, uh, what do you know about uh, uh, piety or uh, justice? And they knew. I know what that is. I'll tell you. And so then Socrates asked the questions. Well, does it include this? Uh, I don't think so. Does it include that? I don't know. So he got them, by the end of the dialogue, to throw their hands up and say, I don't know. I've got other things to do. And sometimes the dialogues ended just like that. So uh, it, he was a little more bombastic than, yeah. than Peter wants us to be. But um, it's simply asking a series of questions to get somebody to realize, you know what? I don't know. Somebody asked me the other day, where did life come from? I don't know. I think scientists have some pretty good ideas of, of where to, to look for, but I don't know. Oh, so you don't know, do you? No, and neither do you. <laughs> Another way to put that is street epistemology is an antidote to the epidemic of overconfidence that I think is, is at the root of a lot of the problems in our society and culture. I actually saw a video the other day of someone using street epistemology on an atheist who said, I'm 100% confident. 
confident that gods don't exist. I have like a logical proof all laid out. And through a little like five minute dialogue, by the end he was like, well, I guess not 100%. <laughs> all right, um, we're gonna now show you, uh, this is just a one minute condensed video. So Anthony Magnabosco is somebody that practices street epistemology. Um, and we just sort of want you to take away the tone of this. Again, this isn't to teach you you know, to go emulate this. <coughs> Anthony has several hundred videos online showing this process. So this isn't just cherry pick. You can go watch full length ones. Um, we can be ready on the audio in case this is loud. Just one minute here. I'm confident that my belief in this God is true. And 0% is that I have no confidence that my belief in this God that is true. And you can be anywhere on the scale. Where would you be on that place? I think right now I'm at 100. Wow. Pretty darn certain. A hundred percent. I mean, you can't get any higher than that. Have you ever reflected on on why you're so high on on the confidence that the belief is true? Well, I guess yeah. You'd have to not. Be 100% certain if you were accepting the possibility that you might be wrong. I see what you're saying. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Have a good day. You too. So, so the, the point that everybody should take home from that is when people who don't like street epistemology or apologists really castigate this and act like you're ambushing people of faith and you're sneaking up on them and it's this terrible, horrible, hostile thing. This is really meant to be a very friendly, positive thing on both sides. And you know, again, hopefully we'll give you some resources that you can go watch some of these videos. You don't see people walking around feeling ashamed. They just got defeated. They just got humiliated. The whole point of this is both sides, You know, the, the person you're speaking to, to feel like they were a part of this discovery that they help figure things out because you're not telling them you're asking them questions so it really is they're solving their own you know their, their difficulties um, so if you want to learn more uh, Peter Bogosian's book a manual for creating atheists is where he sort of pulls together these variety of techniques that are now you know called street epistemology um, and Anthony Magnabosco again has several hundred videos and we'll give you a resource sheet at the end uh, if you want to follow up on these um, Atheos is an app that Peter's been working on with a large group of people in the secular community for the last couple of years. It's been released in New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and very recently the United States. It basically lets you walk through a whole bunch of practice scenarios that, that you're likely to encounter if you start doing street epistemology. What kind of questions are you gonna hit? What are good answers? What are bad answers? There's not always a right and wrong, but you'll, you'll gradually develop the flavor of you're not trying to catch somebody and nail them, which is, you know, a lot of us have that debate technique. You're trying to get them to look back at why do they feel some way? Is it, do they have good evidence for it? Um, so again, that will be on, we'll have all this on the resource page. Um, Streetepistemology.com is another site. They have a, a wonderful um, handout that goes through you know, all the steps of street epistemology and why you do certain things. Um, there's also a private and public Facebook group. And Tim, can you talk about the difference between those? Yeah, so the public page basically says, serves the same function as the website. It's where you can keep track of happenings in the street epistemology community. But the private group is where people like Anthony and myself post about like, hey, I tried this and it, it seemed to have this effect and share videos or uh, anecdotes of how things went and discuss how could I have maybe done better, get some feedback and actually try to develop this technique further. So how can you learn more? Next year, so Atheist Alliance, again, this is gonna be one of the cornerstones of what we do. Um, next year, Peter Bogosian, Anthony Magnabosco are gonna be here in person. We're hopefully gonna be running workshops. We'll hopefully have developed some sort of teaching program. Um, so hopefully everybody will be back here. I'm not sure if that will be part of Dragon Con or if it will be the day before as Atheist Alliance, but um, I think Tim's gonna have a, a mailing list at the end, so if anybody wants to follow up with us about that or yeah. some other things, we're happy so to So both the names. mailing list and the these little handouts with a bunch of links I have some handouts up here, but there's a whole stack in the back to the right of the doors. So I wanted to take a little bit of time here at the end to talk about 
where street epistemology is headed because it is far from complete. Uh, the first thing is just grow the movement, get more people involved, and that's partially what we're doing here. Did you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, we can go through this uh, sort of quickly. Again, the idea is that it's not enough just to have a few people doing this. Uh, street epistemology is basically one-on-one -on -one conversations. So if you have 50 street epistemologists and you have 300 million Americans or 7 billion people, it's going to take forever to get through that. So we really need to get a large mass of people involved. Um, to teach that many people, we need to develop good teaching programs so we can have te oh teachers how to teach other people. You know, we need to grow this geometrically or exponentially if we're going to make headway. And I, I'd like to point out that this is not something that has an immediate effect. So once you talk to somebody for 10, 15 minutes, an hour, don't expect the person to walk away saying, oh, now I've seen the light and that's it. No, you're just planting a seed. And, and for some people, it's also very difficult to look at these things. And it's very uncomfortable to be questioning things they've never questioned before and may feel, uh, I mean, just uh, last night, I was talking to somebody on Facebook, somebody that I, from high school. Uh, who felt she couldn't point out, and I was just following sort of the same thing, just asking questions, and she felt very uncomfortable because she didn't have answers, and we're used to coming up with answers very easily, uh, and, or even make answers if we don't have them, and yet, you know, she couldn't, uh, she couldn't do it, and so she said, like, I don't understand, I don't know what's going on with this conversation, I don't feel comfortable, uh, please don't talk to me about this anymore because I don't know why, but I don't feel comfortable about it. And I said, fine, you know, just step back and let it be. But I know that last night when she was in bed, probably thinking, why couldn't I answer those questions? Why, you know, I'm asking what you think about X or Y or why you behave, feel this way, and she couldn't. So that's, that's important to know that you're not going to get that payback immediately and that it's just this is something that if we do for ourselves and others with time, you know, we'll, I think we'll start seeing an effect. And, and we'll talk a little bit about what not needs to be to that in that respect. There's another uh, aspect to this. Uh, Peter Bakhosian is asking that uh, educators in their our universities should fundamentally change how they teach. <clears throat> and he says, teaching students to be critical thinkers is very important, but teaching them to have a skeptical disposition is more important. And there's too many uh, academic disciplines that are allowing faith into their classroom. And um, he, he, he says we should just tell them the truth. Faith is no um, epistemic standard. And uh, he's provoked me enough uh, with his thoughts that I just wrote a book. It's going to come out on November 1st. It's called uh, Unapologetic, uh, Why Philosophy of Religion Must End. Because uh, that discipline, and more than others, and Phil wrote a nice little blurb for it, I actually convinced him. He said, I was skeptical before I read the book, and now I, I think John did a great job of defending this. Uh, philosophy of religion is not taught the way it should. Uh, it should end. And um, it's because it's a faith, it allows faith to inform the students of answers. And uh, th that faith causes them to argue based on the faith. But the, the faith is what provokes the arguments. And so uh, I'm calling for it to end just in the same way as Hector Avalos is calling for biblical studies to end. And if you don't know about his, uh, his efforts, uh, he's just simply saying teach the students the truth about the Bible. At the Iowa State University, he's teaching the students about the Bible. It's, it's based on myth. It doesn't have any evidence. Some of the things I mentioned earlier in my talk. So uh, I'm joining with him on the academic side. We need academic epistemologists. You know, that aren't teaching, aren't doing it on the street, but doing it in their classes and calling upon the universities to do likewise to try to eliminate as best as possible faith from the classroom. Um, just, just to piggyback on the point that David made, it may not take after one intervention, and that's why it's so important that we really do reach a critical mass where David has a conversation and three months later, Tim bumps into that person, has another slightly uncomfortable conversation, and two weeks later, I do that. And you know, eventually this person starts to wonder, maybe there is something wrong with my fundamental approach to understanding the world. Um, let's see with this. Yeah, so I think, this I think we covered, and we're gonna, why don't we keep moving on yeah. so we can get your. So uh, there will be a generous time for Q&A afterwards, but I wanted to head off some common objections so that they don't take our time. So w the most common I see is it seems disingenuous. You know, you, you clearly have an agenda and you're purposefully hiding that from the other person. Well, like in the example of politics, the fact is if I walk up to a Republican and say, hey, I'm a Democrat, they immediately change their disposition to a defensive stance uh, if we're going to start getting into the differences between Democrats and Republicans and what we believe and why. 
they adopt a defensive stance and get ready for an argument. And I'm not looking for an argument. So uh, it can be disingenuous, but uh, I think it's important to be, uh, to be open to actually having your own mind convinced of their position, as we talked about earlier, because uh, that kind of stance helps you to, I guess, avoid that shutting down. The uh, second one is very closely related to that. It's clearly proselytizing for atheism. I mean, this book is called The Manual for Creating Atheists. I would like to point out that Dr. Boghossian doesn't like the title because, like me, he thinks it can be applied to so much more than just God beliefs. Uh, it's also off-putting to a lot of religious right. people. I have a lot of friends that are religious, and they look at the title and say, well, you know, I'm not willing. It's proselytizing to me about atheism. Tr trust me. Publishers, they have a big sway on how books are titled. <laughs> it, it sells books. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think also a key, a key idea here is, um, with respect to this this conversational mechanism being used by atheists. I, I mean, there, there's, you know, philosophers will say, insofar as people's beliefs are rational, they will tend to converge over time. And this is precisely why, despite all the debates you find in science, there is extraordinary agreement from scientists in Japan and China and South Africa and Norway and so on. I mean, they believe on the, they, they believe, you know, the same fundamental, you know, Avogadro's numbers, the same, you know, Einstein's theory and so on and so on. So uh, when you look at religion, of course, there's tremendous divergence and religion is probably our best example of uh, a non-evidence-based, uh, uh, you know, phenomenon. So I, I think the, the idea is, 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 in addition, is if you can, can, instill in people uh, good patterns of thinking and uh, inability to clearly uh, navigate you know, the, the minefield of bad, bad ideas out there, then ultimately they will, I mean, there will perhaps be a convergence to certain types of beliefs, political, religious, and so on. Yeah, so in the interest of time, I'm going to probably skip the following slide, but uh, the last point there, was about empirical data. You know, all we have right now is anecdotes. How do we know that it even works, that it does what we think it will do? So can you get to the last slide? Uh, frankly, that's a very valid criticism. We frankly don't know how effective or if SE is effective, and that's why, as an engineer, a scientist myself, I think that the next step for street epistemology is rigorous academic studies. We need to pick some basic questions about it. How, how does it affect people's beliefs in the long term? Uh, does it really reduce their confidence or does it just reduce their reported confidence? Things like that. And we can borrow from the groundwork laid by other techniques that are similar, such as deep canvassing. That recently had some great success with uh, an academic study in Miami. Does anyone have know about that here on the panel? You should definitely check it out. It's really cool stuff. Uh, so I think that absolutely we need hard empirical data so that we don't end up fooling ourselves into thinking that we're helping and we're not. So if you're doing a master's degree or a PhD in sociology comes see us after this. And that, that's a serious offer, by the way. We're actually looking for master's students, PhDs, um, if you're, you know, for professors that are potentially interested. This is something over the next year that we really want to, want to try to get some studies underway. And so Tim will send something around, but you know, just come up and talk to us afterward. Yep. Do you want to, anything else or we want to ready for a question? Let's go to questions. Okay, so we have about uh, 11 minutes. If people have questions, we'd be happy to entertain anything. Well, and, and if we can go up to the microphone so it gets recorded. While somebody's coming up, I want to, I want to mention uh, something I should have when I was asked about faith. Peter defines faith as pretending to know something you don't know. And again, that's straight out of Socrates because that's what uh, the sophists were doing. They were pretending to, to be knowers. So uh, he's been blasted by that uh, from Christians who say, well, that's not faith. But it's a more pragmatic definition of faith. It's, it's what actually is done. And, and, and they've been pretending it's a fantasy game for them. They, they just don't know it yet. Um, beyond true justified belief and beyond reliability, 
How have each of you as atheists overcome the getter problem of information insufficiency? And how are um, atheists uh, really something more or less superstitious than just agnostics in denial about your knowledge? I'm sorry, can you say that part again? The getter problem? The getter? The getter problem. Getter problem? The getter get problem of information insufficiency. It's a problem in knowledge. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's I've had conversations with Paul Moser, who claims that he has, he's an expert in epistemology. He was the president of some organization, and he was an editor of some, uh, some journal, and, and he says, I'm stupid. Uh, but no amount of epistemology is going to make a virgin's uh, claim of having a, a baby uh, legitimate. No amount of epistemology, I mean the kind that you're talking about, the, the fact that... Those we have, problems we, don't have information insufficiency problems. What I'm, listen to me. Uh, wh what is going on here is, I think, something is significant. Are, are you a believer? I do, yes. Yeah. Uh, here's what I call what you're doing. If you, don't be upset. Uh, it's called obfuscationist theology. And that is, you're not trying to clarify anything. You're trying to obscure things. You're, you're trying to throw smoke screens up. Now, those are legitimate problems. Okay, I understand that. Those are on the periphery of uh, what's called knowledge. And we have to settle those kinds of questions, you know, justify true belief and what that means. Uh, but for our purposes, when it comes to street epistemology or academic uh, epistemology, we're talking about faith claims that are obviously faith claims, okay? And that is the virgins that have babies, uh, you know, somebody who levitated uh, with, the, with Moses and Elijah, someone who raptured up into heaven, someone who was raised from the dead. And those kind of problems, while significant, they obscure what's going on as a believer, as you are as a believer, of what, what's really being done. Because you can uh, point out that we have problems in understanding, pr p pinpoint precisely what, what evidence is and, and what, what you know, counts as evidence, doesn't obs just obscures the fact that you have a whole host of those extraordinary claims that fall outside of those, uh, those uh, dividing lines between the, the knowledge and faith. If I could obscure it, how can you see it? Uh, could, I, could I make a quick You're trying comment? to obscure it. Mm -hmm. I see through it. Secondly, beyond... Uh, for my other question, sir, uh, governments, facts, and rapists disregard consent. So to what extent does the atheist superego have any right to victimize non-atheists? I think this might be a conversation for afterwards. Next so I, I want to make a, a note that street it. epistemology doesn't work in a setting where you have an audience because you will always adopt a defensive stance because you know people are listening and you don't want to uh, make a fool of yourself by answering poorly. I have not done I'm that I'm not saying you, you, you are. You've done that for me. Uh, but I would I'd like to have a conversation let, afterwards. Let me, give you, let me give you another example, of, if you don't mind, uh, previous uh, question. Uh, and that is, uh, we have a problem understanding what the difference is between science and non-science. Uh, where, where is that demarcation point? At what point are we doing science and what, time, what point are we not doing science? You know, like pseudoscience versus science. And so there's this gray area that people discuss, and legitimately so, brighter minds than me. Uh, but that's not the demarcation point between not what's considered knowledge and evidence and what isn't. It is this faith claims, the, the kind that I just mentioned, and if you heard my talk earlier about the superstitions in the Bible, the evil eye and the heart and the things like that, those things are not even close to the, the things that they're debating. These things have no evidence for them at all. I mean, except, I, except the sincere person's testimony, you know, right. something written in a book somewhere. No, I, 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 I think they're perfectly good questions, but I, I think part of the reason we're struggling is some of the terms are, I think, need to be defined and, and probably in a, a, a conversational setting afterwards would be better mm -hmm. for, you know, getting the same vocabulary so we can have a productive conversation. I used to ask those same kinds of questions, and I, I used it to obscure the fact that I believed a virgin had a baby, and I thought that that was good enough. Okay, can we have next I'm a pediatrician, so I'm most commonly trying to change beliefs about vaccines. And I generally feel I don't have the luxury of this kind of approach, um, that my obligations for informed lack of consent and liability coverage kind of force me to be more confrontational to get that information out there. As a physician, do you have any other insight in that particular situation? Well, you're going to be under time constraints. So, you know, it may depend on the setting. You might actually have good success asking why is it that you don't want to get vaccinated? And let's say because of autism. Why, do you, why are you concerned about autism? Because Jenny McCarthy and Jim Carrey 
talk about it. Do you think that it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm a medical professional, I've trained for all these years, and this is what my stuff has shown. Do you think that being an actor and, uh, you know, do you think that gives them some better insights into the medicine, or do you think that my four years of medical school, my training in, in pediatric, so you might actually get a positive reaction. Now, when it comes to liability and covering yourself, that's a totally different issue where you need to put down, eventually, I advise this patient that they should get this because it's in their medical interest. You know, those are separate issues. Um, and it's a big social problem. I don't know that a pediatrician seeing, if you're seeing you know, 30 patients and you don't have those extra 15 or 20 minutes to have a long, productive dialogue, I don't know how feasible it would be. But I think, I think it's probably worth trying. Thank you. Hi. Um, I know there hasn't been a lot of academic study on this topic, um, but does anyone have any anecdotes about how third parties respond to these kind of challenges when they come from women as opposed to men? Is there any research into differences based on gender or sex and how women are responded to when asking challenging questions? I think that what we've seen so far is, is anecdotal and, and, uh, and cultural in, in a way. I mean, I keep bringing up culture because that's sort of my focus. The, the reason why we're, my group exists is to focus on this particular uh, group of uh, folks, uh, of Americans. And, um, and, and I think that um, right now I've seen mostly men doing the talking or doing the conversations. We certainly need to have a lot more uh, women uh, doing it and, and trying to see if, you know, if the approach is different. They, I think the advantage of uh, women doing it is that they may seem uh, less threatening uh, to someone when their beliefs or their, 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 what they think they know has, is being questioned by themselves. So if you're interested, I do know of one woman who does go out and do the, the camera thing like Anthony and uploads them to YouTube occasionally not nearly as often, because he has hundreds of videos. Uh, the, there, this does raise the issue of anecdotal evidence. People have approached Anthony saying, you know, you have hundreds of videos on YouTube. Uh, I'm interested in maybe doing a statistical analysis. And he's like, don't do it. And I'm like, don't do it, because I know Anthony. He's a, he's a friend of mine. He's a great guy. But for all I know, for every one video he uploads to YouTube, he has nine where he tried the exact same thing and it failed horribly. And so you can't draw any conclusions that way. Or it even the be, people that are willing to talk are probably certain kind of people more. Yeah, you know, it's more definitely outgoing. not a statistical sampling. And so, you know, I know there's some data points from at least one woman doing it and taking video of that, but everything's going to be cherry picked until we get into an actual academic study. And I want to touch on David's point also. Um, street epistemology should be, even from, you know, whether it's man or woman, very non-threatening. And when you watch Anthony do this, the vast majority of time, he'll ask a short question, and the interlocutor, the person he's speaking with, will do most of the talking and the thinking and the reflecting. It, it's also, it's perhaps worth saying, I mean, there, there are, um, there, there's a certain power dynamic that, that uh, emerges when you have a male and a, a female. I mean, st statistically speaking, I mean, studies show that, that men tend to dominate the conversation more. Women get interrupted by both men and women more often than, than men do. So it's sort of another sort of nice thing about this Socratic you know, street epistemology um, situation is it really levels. It's about listening. Uh, it's, it's more of a passive sort of engagement in the, the conversation than... Uh, you know, that, that makes it less, less possible for, for certain individuals to dominate and monopolize and so on. This seems like a, uh, a really promising approach, but one of the issues that I've observed is that a lot of people just don't care that much about bigger issues. Um, there seems to be a lot of apathy that I run into when I talk to people. And some people are very passionate. It's, a great, it's great to have a conversation with even people who disagree with you. But do you have any tips for getting people to motivate people to apathy. care? They're all, I'm all for apathy. <laughs> I think people ought to be apathetic about God. Right. They're, all, they're all apathetic up until when they get to Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> and then they become rabid. <laughs> so, that we can, so that we can work our magic. <laughs> are you talking about religion or you mean broader social issues and other yeah, things? Broader, that we'd like to broader issues. I mean, the, the, I think this approach could be used for a lot mm -hmm. of different issues. Yeah. So... Again, you can use this method, so you could even use street epistemology to introduce that. Like, you don't seem so concerned about global warming or about Republicans and Democrats not talking. Can I ask you why that is? You know, maybe you can get into a conversation. I don't know how you fix that. That's an enormous social problem. It's not 
directly in the purview of street epistemology, but it should be part of our conversation. The fact that we watch silly TV while all, all sorts of really bad things are happening is a problem that's going to catch up with our kids and grandkids, and you know, it, it's a, a shame that we're wasting our opportunity. Thank you. Actually, an atheist, I, I want to clarify just in case I wasn't clear. Uh, if people are apathetic about God, that's, that's an atheist society. A religion, yeah.